Classical art forms are like vast oceans. A dip in its pristine waters and you will be swimming in it till eternity. It's a work of a lifetime and for some many lifetimes. Have you ever watched a beautiful performance and wondered what must be going in to be able to perform at that level of excellence? Clearly we all know the response is riyaz. Do you think the word riyaz can be confined to the word practice? To me it has way more connotations and references. Don't you wish they told you what exactly they do when they say hum riyaz karte hain? Well these are the questions that intrigued me and I decided to get some answers. Not to keep them with me but to share with the world at large the vision of these artists their secrets hence the series raz riyaz ka namaskaram and a warm welcome to raz riyaz ka season 3 many many years ago when youtube had just about started becoming popular a video popped open into my window and i look at this beautiful graceful dancer with long limbs and tall frame and lines that would give euclid a heavy complex and i was absolutely moved and i admired the way uh, she had clarity and conviction even in that little window on my laptop that statuesque dancer was none other than navya natrajan a leading bharatanatyam exponent of our country she is energy and grace juxtaposed together She has her work which is steeped in tradition yet has the beautiful fragrance of a contemporary thought process. She is the perfect combination of an agile dancing body and a sensitive thinking mind. And we are most delighted to have her on Raz Riyaz ka season 3. So a warm welcome to Navya Natrajan and thank you so much for gracing the series. Thank you so much Prachi. It's such a pleasure to be a part of this and I'll just I was quite amazed with your introduction actually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've been working on this for some time. I'm like this is how I'm going to introduce Navya Thank because you so this actually much. happened. Yeah. And I still remember this video that I'm talking about. Yeah. I think was the Natkuranji Varna. Okay. Mm. And it's a very very old video. You yes. must be many years younger obviously. I mean many many. I think I was in my let's just say late 20s early but, 30s but but yeah. since then to now you've only grown and uh, i must say that video really i i think i watched a lot of you after that mm-hmm. and i was so so i was admiring you a Thank lot you so much <laughs> um so usually i hit the hammer straight on the head and mm-hmm. i'd straight come to okay what is riyaz and all of that but i don't know with you i feel like easing into it a little bit i want to like warm up into it So I want to know from you because I know you've had multiple influences in your life and you've had a couple of uh, gurus who you've trained from. So I want you to stand at this point in life and if you were to just look back and glance mm. and what are the things you've gathered from them over mm. the years if you can just relive that journey a little bit with us. Sure and that's been a real journey for me because and I'm really thankful for that. because i feel um, for example when i started off dancing so uh, started learning under radhika kalyani and she is a student of uh, guru kj sarasa and uh, guru shrimati uh, chitra vishweshwaran so i did marangetram under her in madras so what i realized i was what 10 when i did marangetram and i joined her when i was 7 and a half and that's where the foundation was set and which is practice and discipline and i didn't know these terms at that point right because <laughs> you're so you're engaged with your school work you're busy playing with stud uh, friends and then i realized she's the one some way it was more like osmosis where she just instilled that quality in me and i didn't I've never realize so for example if i don't practice and i go to class she has a very nice way of saying i think you need to practice and then come why don't you just go back and practice mm. though initially i used to get hurt but now on you know hindsight i'm like wow that's exactly what was needed for me so discipline and dedication was from her then i moved to padmini ramachandran guru padmini ramachandran because my dad got a transfer from chennai to uh, hosur and uh, and she was living in she's living in bangalore she was living in bangalore then 
so my parents used to every weekend commute and take me to Padmini ma'am and that was a very very different journey I think I learned a whole lot of it's not just the technique because when you do your arangetram by then you've already trained in your technique be mm. it Nrutta or Abhinaya besides this what I learned from her is you spoke about the strength part right mm. that's where I got it because she would always say that you know the way you're rooted to the ground is so essential because mm. that is where that first step starts that is where the energy starts mm. so learning that kind of strength from her and I, I'm sure you would have heard this from all the Natapriyans the mm. schools called Natapriya mm. she would make last minute changes to pieces yes I've heard, heard such this, stories yeah? Yeah. Yes, yes this is <laughs> Uh, it's an ongoing thing up uh, with Nata Priya, I guess, <laughs> because she would make these last-minute changes, and she expects you to absorb that change then and, and then there. And there. So she would have a term saying, "You're just not professional if you can't do it." And imagine at the age of twelve and thirteen, you really don't know what profession means. All you know is you're studying, yeah. right? And she would just say, "No, you have to do it." It was just matter of fact. There was no argument there. Wow. Though at that time we would actually, what do you say, fret. Just thinking of it, true. It really helped us later. But see what it did. Like in a long-term journey, you see, you are ready for anything. Yes. Ever ready like that? You have to be. Mm. And I think it was just not in dance. It was a life lesson that I learned. Mm. I've learned many life lessons from her. Things like even if things don't work, mm. she'll say, "That's done. That's gone. That moment is gone. Think of mm. the next." Don't have to sit and cry over it. Yes, look into it and think, "Where did I go wrong?" But she says, "There's no time to waste. Go to the next one." You know, so things like this, these are huge life lessons. When you go through life is when these things come back. You don't know when it's gone into your system, but they really surface when you need them. Just when you need them. Which, just when you need them. So, so you so hear her voice very often coming back to you. Very often. And uh, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because we've had so many moments, even be it solo performances, be it group performances with her. You learn how to adjust to things very fast. For example, I remember I was um, Sita in one of those uh, dramas, dance dramas, and the person who was supposed to do Hanuman couldn't change. You know, there was some issue mm -hmm. the back, uh, back, the green room, and she just, she just send a word and say, Navya, just be prepared. I guess you know what the role is. <gasps> Come back as Hanuman. No way. Which means, while the show is happening, while the show is happening, which means she expects each of us. So when something, when she's teaching a, one student, see now things are very different. The student comes in, you mm. have one on one, she goes. Right. But then things were very different. We Everybody was sit, there. Yeah, yeah, we would sit for another person's class, True. and she would say, "Now you say the alarupu, you sing the jatiswaram, and then observe what the dancer is doing." So you keep this a lot. That's why I said osmosis was very important. Mm. You observe, and then you absorb what is happening. So because I knew what the role was, within minutes, I had to change and come on to stage and do uh, the role of a Hanuman. Fantastic. These are things, you don't know the importance then, but trust me, these are huge life lessons. And this is like the training, what you say, going through that drill or that grilling, which comes handy very so many years much, later. Very much, because you have to be on your toes. And grasping mm. it helped my studies actually so you know when you handling two things at a time mm. you realize that's quality time at this point i have to grasp this and produce this there's no there are no excuses so from her these are the things i learned and then of course i moved to a lakshman swami of mm. nutte lakshana chennai and bragaka braga Vesel. and you know that's what i was thinking i've been very blessed that every stage in my life i had the right gurus come into my life and I think to have that is a great blessing. Absolutely. Because the gurus who understand you, who know how to train you, who know your weaknesses and your strength, and to kind of uh, capitalize on that, that was very good. And for Lakshman, sir, I've learned, it's a, I mean, he's another treasure trove, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to learning about grays, understanding lines, understanding um, the nuances of when you're, with the choreography, when it comes to nrutta, or how much can you lend? Where mm. is the punch? Where is the grace? Mm. And with Bragaka, I don't have to say anything. I know. I think more than a, I mean, she's a true guru because lovely human being. And uh, those years, I was what uh, very young when I was in my late twenties when I joined her. And every time to just be there and to observe what she's teaching and how she's teaching and how she is in that moment, mm. in that expression. Um, 
it's it's been a I don't know how to say an institution or by herself if I can say so and continues the journey keeps continuing so every time I choreograph something I try to see okay am I applying what Bragaka has told me are these the features that I can add and she like I've told once before that she's the kind of guru who like you know gives you the the roots to hold on to and the wings to fly Mm. So I've been oh, that's such very, a beautiful metaphor. I've been very blessed with all the four gurus that I've had, and uh, ever thankful for that. And you mm-hmm. had such a beautiful opportunity of dancing with her during COVID yes, for the yes. uh, G V Ramani. Uh, yes. Natya Vamsham. Natya Vamsham. Yeah, yes, that, that was such a unique experience. Oh, totally. Because imagine dancing with a stalwart. I mean, I forget a guru alone. Uh-huh. She's stalwart and a guru, True. and just to stand and share that stage, I think. Uh, Night. That would have also taught you so much, much in that whole lot, experience. A lot, just because she's choreographing. Mm. And, but the funny thing is, you know, she's so humble and she's so mm. childlike. That's so she, she just when just she's doing a piece, she'll be like, "Was that right? What I did?" I'm like, "Oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> please, please, no, don't do this." And uh, it's just that you know what they they used a very nice term called. Um, I think it was a transference of um, yeah, the, the the knowledge. Like and mm. i think from her it's just not knowledge there's wisdom that comes through mm. you know when you're learning a piece from her and you're performing i had to do uh, also see mm. uh, a padam with akka mm. and the way she helped me understand that character and get into the depths of that character and she's also enacting it there so imagine she's a teacher a guru who's looking at what you're performing she's correcting and yet she has to be there mm. and uh, i mean i it was a great experience just looking at her learning from her seeing how what's the perspective with which she's looking at things so. and like you said it's not just about the art but also the person that she yes. is i think there's so much transference that happens yes. when you even watch our gurus yes. when they are a certain way so this glance back is like really <laughs> rich yeah. and really you're blessed I'm blessed, yeah. Thank so God. you touched upon academics in between right now, like you were studying, and I believe you are a microbiologist yes. and a research assistant. I was a research assistant, assistant which are like such heavy terms. <laughs> and then I even read in an interview where you said you were sitting for an interview, and it came as a flash uh, that this is not what you really yeah. want to do. Yeah. So right now, I want you to relive that moment <laughs> and reenact that moment for us as to what really happened in that interview mm-hmm. and what was this change of mind all about. So I did my masters in microbiology and I was working as a research assistant for the Vital Malaya Scientific Research Foundation. Mm-hmm. And then the then uh, head he said why don't you enroll? He saw my work and he said I think you should enroll for a PhD. Mm-hmm. And I, I I clearly remember I was in front of a burette that's where you have those chemicals falling into that beaker. Mm-hmm. and this thing is ringing in my head where he said now i think you're ready for enrolling into phd because that's what i want to do all my life you know because for the longest time dance was just a hobby mm. i was passionate about it very disciplined about it but still i remember my friends telling me now we are you should take up dance full time mm. and i was like oh, you know no i really need to stand on both my legs and earn and see where i go with it that's there on one end and then this person just said uh, enroll for phd and i distinctly remember i saw the drop falling into the beaker and i said shoot no i can't i said what am i going to do sitting here though this is a beautiful place to be in and research i said i don't find myself here and then i went for an interview mm-hmm. that's when it was a total eye opener i said i passed the interview i just came out of the interview room i remember calling up my parents i said i'm not going to do this <laughs> and my dad I'm was, sure they were not surprised I mean my dad because my dad always told me that Navya always understand that you need to be independent mm. you need to stand on both your legs and earn so that you have a life mm. don't depend on people so that's so he was very clear mm. all along he was supportive both my parents my mom loves dancing uh, one thing i have to add here every artist like the main support system is the family yeah. it's only if you have them yes. can you really achieve what you definitely want to my parents have been my pillars mm. there's no doubt about it They're, besides the gurus that i've had Absolutely. i've been extremely blessed to have my parents and so both of them supported me but i but they're also very clear about it mm. right but my dad was like are you sure and i said yes But I like what he said. He said, "You have clarity of thought right now. You mm-hmm. did what you want to do. You know what you have to do. This is your life. Continue." 
So that's when I decided uh, I'm going to take up dance and uh, never looked back. Yes, as you start working and performing, yes, there are days, I'm being very honest, I was like, why did I do this? Why am I doing this? But that sheer love, there is, it's a very tender love that you have for your art, right? It's, it's not that it's, it's demanding, it's all of that. But if you share a very true, honest relationship mm. with your art, you will know why you're here. And I just tell myself, this is why you're here. Forget all the hardships. This is what you like, love to do the most. And that day also you were choreographing in your mind. Yes. And you saw that drop fall. Yes. It was a full-blown choreography. It was because I had a performance. <laughs> and I was choreographing that piece. <laughs> and that's when I was like, oh my God, why am I doing this? I'm choreographing one day and I'm seeing this. And I said, okay, you know what? Perhaps there are people who can juggle. I am not one of those. No. I said, I need to invest. I think this is my calling. Tom, Tadim. So now we come to the quintessential question of the series. Mm. So what does the word riyaz or as we call sadhana or practice mean mm. to you? Well, actually when I was thinking about it, I realized that we don't know how in deep this word is, you know. It's a very intense, beautiful, um, a word which has many layers and extremely personal. Mm. And I feel you really can't find an equivalent in the English language. Though we loosely translate it as practice, mm. yes, it encompasses practice and uh, discipline because that's the foundation. Without that, there's no riyas, right? So it, it is that, but it goes beyond that. And it's a very um, personal journey. And I think it's a lifelong pursuit. It doesn't, it doesn't have a full stop. I, think, I guess as an artist, till you take your last breath, you, you have to be in riyas. And because as you grow, like I said, when I first joined, it was about technique, it was about practice, it's about discipline, uh, dedication, and all of it. But when you grow with your art form, you actually develop a kind of a relationship with mm. it. There is a bond that you form and, and you have start having these conversations with it. And you realize that at one point there is something that is happening, you know, it's a, it's a cycle that is happening. And then you realize, oh my God, this is Riyaz. You can't stop at practice. You can't stop at just thinking. It is a constant process. You're seeking something constantly. And uh, yeah, that is Riyaz for me. So you've put it so beautifully, mm -hmm. Navya. I mean, this is only what I was saying that, you know, it's not just about the dancing body. It's also mind, mind. that has to equally support because these are ideas even to articulate it mm. is something which not everybody is able to do. And I think You've given us a very beautiful way of, ah, this is what Riyaz mm -hmm. is. So thank, thank you, you for that. And what I want to then come to is, because as we know, our viewers do watch this series. Mm -hmm. And I, at this point, I want to just take a moment and thank all of you for supporting this series so beautifully because we've got comments and messages and emails saying that you know we refer to this as and when we feel a little low or you feel uninspired and then any video pops up you listen to people and you know performers such as Navya and many others who featured and you are your dose is done that one injection <laughs> is done for the day so um, what they would really want is this is a little bit Okay, let's let's put it like this. This is something that you've experienced over all these decades and you're able to put it in words. Mm -hmm. But there are many young dancers who still don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I feel like in this series, through this series, if we can offer something very tangible, mm -hmm. very hands-on. Mm -hmm. So my next question is very basic. Like when you enter the studio, what is it that you do? Mm -hmm. um, for example, I know you practice every day. Mm -hmm because there is nothing like you cannot not practice every day so if there is a week that you have how do you divide it how do you plan it just if you can give us some potent tools sure sure okay now you said that I practice every day that's not true also 
Breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, come on, at the end of the day, we all are humans, right? Yes. So the days when, I remember there are days when I just drag myself to the studio. I'm like, okay, Navya, today you're just not in the mood. It, maybe it's mental, emotional, physical, yeah? Anything. Then I'll switch on the thing. I'll say, okay, let's just see where the body goes. Let's just see Thanks where the mind goes. Thanks for being so honest. <laughs> no, but that's the truth. Trust me, everybody goes through it, yeah? True. So then I'll be like, okay, let me see how I feel. Let me see how the body moves. And sometimes, like for example, I start with an alari pose. I feel it is the most demanding piece. Even Varnam is easy compared to an alari pose. Mm. Like doing a tattadagu, right? So I'll see, okay, is the body moving? At times, immediately the body buckles up and it's ready for the grind. Mm. But there are days it just doesn't move. Mm. And earlier, I used to be, as a, when I was growing up, I used to be very... Uh, stern and very uh, unkind to myself, I can use that word. Later I realized it is okay mm. for the body not to feel good on certain days. But not every other day, yeah? because then that's an excuse that you give yourself not to practice. True. So that doesn't happen. But there are days like that, but then it is so beautiful. That's when I said that conversation that happens with the art form. It somewhere seeps in and even if I can do half of an alari poo that day and then move on to Jataswaram, I am happy. Mm. But there are days like that, but on a good normal day, mm. uh, so I get up in the morning, I have my first cup of coffee, which I can't miss. <laughs> so after that is when I actually do almost like one, one and a half hours of yoga, this breathing technique. There is uh, a lot of uh, asanas and a little bit of meditation at the end of that, because automatically the body goes into that kind of a state. And after that, of course, you know, just go about, I just take like a half an hour to 40 minute break then I practice and it depends now also one thing that we have to realize is practice is not for a performance mm. the riyas is not for a performance alone though as performers you have to be ready riyas is something like you said it has to be a lifelong thing so you're practicing not for a performance but you're practicing just to align yourself so I do my alari poo sometimes then I do jatiswaram and I might do two three jatis from Amarna. Mm. So practice happens and of course if I'm closer to a performance because you've practiced all these days when you take up the piece that you want to do then obviously the body is responding. Absolutely. So that happens and then I also go for my every alternate day I try and do strength training these mm. days. I've just started it a couple of years back and I feel that has definitely added to my, it added value to my uh, training because in Bharatanatyam or in any art form sometimes you don't use certain muscles. Whereas these muscles are used when you do strength training and I have a very good set of people with whom I work and sometimes as dancers you do have aches and pains mm. and they help you release that and understand your body better. So I do that as well. So in a week either there's strength training, there's yoga, there's dance and of course sometimes I completely take off. Mm. Sometimes it's Saturday and Sunday I will not budge. And I but think body needs that rest body as needs well. that because you can't be harsh on your body. Mm. It is an instrument. True. It's just like a car. You need to keep greasing it every other day, right? And you need to run it as well. So you need to learn to understand your body. And sometimes, and especially as you grow older, you realize that, yes, the body needs a little bit of leeway. You know, you don't mm. over, you don't abuse it. Correct. So there are days when I would go full out, full throttle. And there are days when I just make it easy on myself. And... More Drutta is there, but I also because Bragaka is very particular. She mm. says, "Do you realize that just as much as you practice your Drutta, you need to practice your Abhinaya?" And that Abhinaya is something is that everyone kind of just far feel. more draining because yeah. emotion. In, you're investing your emotion in that. So how so, do you practice your Abhinaya? So it depends. Now, if I take up a Varnam, mm. there are days when I do my my Jatis, mm. and in between, I'm just listening to the music, and I'm. Because every, because you already have a plan on your, you plan mm. about your Varnam, right? But certain days there are ideas perhaps, say again, it's a part of Riyaz. You read up something mm. or you look around. You, you're interacting with people, you're seeing their experiences or talk, hearing about it. Or you're seeing a movie. There are certain things that stick with you. You don't even realize that. At some level, at some conscious level, it's still there. So when I'm doing an uh, Abhinaya piece or expression, that sometimes spills into this and I'm like, oh, that uh, emotion perhaps is what I'm experiencing now. And then I start working around that. So, so there are days when maybe my mudra is all falling apart, but I'm just going with that emotion. Like, okay, how was it if she was like this? How was it if he was looking at her like that? So for me, it is, 
I like my practice sessions mm. because I can explore. There is Mano Dharma there, right? I can explore and discover. And I think that journey is exciting for me. So that's why I love my practice sessions. And sometimes my mom does come and watch. And mm. sometimes I'm like, no, no, no. This is my space. Today is not the day. <laughs> I'm like, today I want to just be there and enjoy what the music is doing to me and what my, uh, who, how I am responding to that. And I feel very excited about such things. So, wow. Yeah. You are actually answering a lot of my questions just, you know, as you're going along. Like okay. where you mentioned the word Manodharma. Yeah. So when you have, a, like I see there is not a set structure as mm. such to your uh, practice or riyas. You go slightly impulsively listening to the body and the mind like yeah. you said. And how often do you feel this trickling onto stage? Like that is one thing. Mm. And my second question also, which you can follow up is like the two things that we dancers always take for granted is the warm up and the cool down. Mm -hmm. So how important is that for you? And what is it that you do for your warm up, cool down and about how it's trickling onto trickling. the stage? Oh, that's a very important thing because I think, uh, you know, that warm up and that cool down is very crucial when you become an artist or a performing artist. Practice, even if that practice time reduces, it's okay. Mm. But that warm up and cool down is very important. And I feel I spend a lot of time, like I said, that yoga part mm. is my warm up. Correct. And uh, even in my fitness, like off late, I've learned how to release those muscles. You know, we use those, uh, what I call medicine balls. Mm -hmm. We actually release those muscles. And I found a huge difference. Maybe when I practice, sometimes I get a back pain. I go back and they address it. And they tell me exactly where the problem is and they help me release and understand that. So I feel as a performing artist or even as a student, we all are students of art, we have to first learn to respect our body through these warm-ups. And I think like you're mentioning, we need to reach out to the professionals who yes. handle these areas yes. rather than trying to also do something. Yes. Because like you said, you know there are people who are able to point out these yeah. things. So seek that help very much because mm. I'm no expert. Mm. I don't know my, I know my body when it's tired or it's, it's, it's experiencing some pain, but what is it that is causing the problem? And see, it's easy now to just have tablets and not address the root cause. What I've seen here long is long term, it, long term yeah. it doesn't help. And the root cause, the moment you address the root cause, be it your physical, mental, emotional health, then you actually have a tool. Mm. So then you know how to go about it till the end. Correct. So having an expert advice is my personal opinion will definitely help. And cooling down also is a mandatory. Like before I sleep, I stretch. Wow. So I've been told That's that awesome. even after dance, you can just, you know, usually you, you lie on the floor put both my legs up so that there's blood flow mm. for even for yoga they say that and you're helping your heart recoup mm. so that is very good for your back as well so I do that then before I sleep I stretch I've been taught calf muscle stretch hamstring stretch then your uh, quads then QL stretch so those things really help and I think I've had a sound sleep after the stretch so those two are very important and I would urge everybody to just uh, even even many people do calorie pite, right? It's mm. supposed to be very good. So these are very good things. And the other thing you asked me was, what uh, how about does it, how mm. it translates onto stage, like the mano dharma? Mm. I was talking in terms particularly with the abhinaya, abhinaya practice. Practice, yeah. Because that's where typically, if you have a live uh, orchestra, then these things come. Then how does it help uh, inform your performance? Performance, yeah. So I think the maximum work is done in your studio, mm. in your dance space. That is the space where you really have to invest uh, the knowledge that you've received from your gurus and uh, invest your emotion in it. Because Abhinaya at a superficial level really doesn't, I think, forget about the audience, it doesn't touch your, doesn't mm. touch your own soul. So you need to really go through those emotions then. And many a times when it comes onto the stage, because you've done so much of work earlier, right? And it's not about planning out your actions. You can plan to a certain extent, but if you've invested in it, the moment you come on stage, something else actually happens. Absolutely. It is very intangible. And there are days when you're stuck, you're like, wow. <laughs> now that was a moment I was looking for. Okay. And many a times I feel, if that moment doesn't happen, you know, however well you've performed, you feel, oh, that moment that I experienced in the studio, how, how come it didn't translate on stage? Yeah. There are those days, but 
but when you invest so much i remember all my gurus they say you do let's say you do around 70% practice 25% comes on Come stage ouch <laughs> yeah so i was like aha uh-huh, that can't be you know i really have to work and abhinay is a it's a real process even on stage you know because you're going through a gamut of emotions and to kind of uh, what do you say distill it and refine it and bring out and articulate that with your audience uh, it's a very accelerating feeling and and so many factors come in play mm. on that particular day so mm. in fact uh, Uh, in marathi there is a term called prayog huh. and they use this term uh, with theater with reference huh. to theater so they say that uh, aaj ha prayog ahe aaj huh. 10 va prayog ahe so 10 va prayog is today is the 10th prayog wow. now prayog translate translates as experiment hmm. so every artistic exposition on that day, day is an actually experiment. an experiment yeah. you don't know what factors will work what mm-hmm. will not work what is the success of that mm. prayoga yeah. that day so i i find that reference so beautiful because like you said you don't know what's going to happen you really because you, there's so many other things paraphernalia mm. right it's the stage then the musicians yeah. now if the vocalist is in a particular mood and then he joins you or he she joins <laughs> you it's there's a rapport built Correct. there are days when that may not happen mm. and one thing i've also learned with time and with experience is that one needs to let go mm. on stage that's you such a beautiful really point you need to let go because how much ever you've practiced and how much ever you have worked hard you should understand that at that moment you're just an it's just an instrument something has to flow through you because the work is done work like is said. done yeah. but on stage there is something else that is happening mm. you know there is a kind of energy that you experience and at that point if you're trying to hold on to like saying this is exactly how i would do it it just you have to just before entering the stage i feel now i'm practicing that i keep telling myself now we're just let go let it happen you've done your bit let it happen wow. and let's see and let's also like you said it's a beautiful word ex- ex- experiment right mm. it is an experiment and mm. also an experience you may not get it again the next day absolutely so not. i'm telling myself these days that it's difficult to let go but i'm telling myself just let go and see where you go with it so and then again coming back to riyas and like you said it is an ongoing process it's a conversation and you have your days where you don't feel like it but i think every time you enter your space that first movement or that mm. first step is so difficult to take you know yeah. like you said the alaripo so i wanted to read out something very beautiful to our viewers and to you um, i read somewhere fret not where the road will take you instead concentrate on the first step mm. that's the hardest part and that's what you are responsible for once you take that step let everything do what it naturally does oh. and the rest will follow beautiful isn't so it so true so true and i think it just fits so perfectly well with what you just shared mm. and i i just it just resonated perfectly it's so beautifully written isn't you know it? i think it's just not an art i think in life in general yeah in life it's in so general. important to just <laughs> that being in the present right yeah. that's what uh, the person has written being in the present yeah so bringing you back to padmini teacher and i know that she's always trained you as a soloist and something but what i also have seen is that you've been a part of some ensemble works mm. and then it comes into group choreography mm. so does your training and your working towards that change when you're working as a soloist and working as a group member of a group mm. how are, what are the dynamics of that well the thing is when you are a soloist there is a you have a kind of a structure in place mm. right when you start becoming a part of a group you understand that it's not about you mm. it is it's a collective effort so the energy transfers from one dancer to the other dancer is very essential there has to be a rapport you can't just stand out and say i am the solo so it doesn't really i mean it makes no sense yeah <laughs> and you have to understand that it is a collective effort and True. if you're trying to in fact if you stand out that's yeah. that's, that's actually bad, bad yeah <laughs> and so you also learn that way to observe other dancers yes. usually you you know as a solos you only observe yourself right mm. but or you go for a performance but when you're working with them you realize that you're actually looking at them you're learning something from them you're giving something to them there's a lot of again i go back to the word osmosis because mm. i really truly believe 
it's osmosis that helps you grow so there is that uh, dynamic there's interaction that you learn from each other and that actually has helped my solo that's Wonderful. how i would put it because you learn uh, that i don't know through observation you learn a lot and also that that like i, I would say that energy transfer like mm. you you're doing a particular step in a particular speed and there is a, a rhythm uh, what is a timeline for it mm. another one is doing at the same timeline but what's the difference between the two mm. right and when you start realizing this you understand that when you're performing that difference can be brought in your nritta or in your abhinaya mm. i don't know if i'm very clear about it for example i understood that there's another way also of doing this particular ah, thing and like i can you look at it with one lens one lens you're having multiple lenses multiple lenses you're seeing oh you're like oh this is interesting because that energy of that body has changed right so how do i imbibe that and be a part of it wow and i think solo it, uh, working in group has definitely helped me understand space also what is the importance of space a spatial distribution of adavus and so if and sometimes what we understand is as solos you have to hold the center i'm like no you know i can imagine there are two three other bodies and i can take a corner and use that corner to my benefit mm. so how does that corner have an effect on that piece mm. so that is how i started thinking so i think that's really helped me a lot so you answered one of my question already when you said that you don't particularly uh, do your riyas for a performance mm. it is an ongoing process and when there is a performance it kind of flows because the body is ever ready to mm. kind of be in that drill but yes of course you focus on that performance the one thing that i feel we always neglect is we do all of this warm up and cool down and everything in the studio but on the day of the performance mm -hmm. you just go quickly get ready there are delays and you are you know mm. not warmed up is there a ritual that you follow before you go and step on stage if that is if you would share with us sure i because even on that day i think uh it's it's there are two things that like are working like what is your performance day like yeah so there are two things working for me one is uh the, the mental uh, the kind of thoughts that are running in your head mm. and the other is how to prep your physical body mm. so i'm prepping two things at the same time so for that for my mental and emotional uh, sanity and stability i go to yoga in the morning but i may not do the entire one and a half because that's quite a stretch mm. so i just take important asanas out of it for example i do my breathing technique then i'll do my surya namaskaram and and i also do the release which i've been taught by the fitness uh, people so i do the release i do these asanas and i do certain stretches taught by them and then i just relax whatever happens and then before i get on to the stage i actually do couple of stretches again and i do let's say couple of uh, like nat adavas mm -hmm. just to get that heart pumping and right. going you know so that's what i do and then i'm ready on stage but i don't tire myself mm -hmm. out on that day because because you do have a full program a full performance up. and i'm not that kind who can tire and then go and perform i like to feel little and i don't go through my pieces because i want to just keep them fresh for myself absolutely when i get onto that stage so yeah so i you, but the first thing i think of is to kind of drain my thoughts because mm -hmm. then you're physically you're better off because it can be quite daunting i know you're performing at the music academy yeah. this year the 6 o'clock slot yeah. congratulations thank you very excited about thank that you. and i can imagine the kind of butterflies please tell me you have butterflies i do <laughs> <laughs> it is good to know that oh, she has go, but please we i think we'll have this uh, till the end very end yeah. is going to be there yeah so yes it is quite a daunting thing but then yet you have to collect yourself in such a way that you know What is your food like? Like, do you eat or not? Quite. Uh, I, I basically I'm a foodie, uh -huh. <laughs> but on that particular day, it is mainly carbs for me. So to mm. be oats, mm. uh, idlis, or curd rice. These are my go-to, and bananas. Okay. And of course, uh, a bar of chocolate. If I not the entire bar, but, a but bit just of it. to get that little yes, energy. Yes. Yes. 
Wow. So there is a ritual even for food. So you know, <laughs> as dancers, you just end up thinking like, okay, this is uh, stretching is important. Mm. But food is something. Nutrition is something Very that you important. end up neglecting. You want yes. to talk a little bit about nutrition in terms yeah, of so for dancers, young for dancers. dancers yeah, I, I am no expert at it, but I can just really tell you what, what you I do, yeah. follow because uh, I remember I, I, I long back ago when I was going through something, I asked my nutritionist. And uh, she was telling me that, so I basically, okay, this is a thing out, but I usually eat five meals, not big meals, mm. but five times a day. Right. And I have been doing this ever since I was a kid, not because I knew about the nutritional <laughs> aspect. It was just that after every one and a half, two hours, I will be hungry. <laughs> so that continued. So when I went to my dietitian, I said, this is my, and she's like, oh, it seems to be fine because you don't need me. You, don't need me. <laughs> exactly. like, you seem to be fine. But however, you need to kind of reduce on your sweet intake. I have a uh, sweet tooth. Lovely. So I love sweets and ice creams and cakes and pastries and all. I can't stay away from wow. it. But I try my best these days hmm. to at least stay away a bit. But True. I can't. Twice a week, I have to have... I, I think it's, it's 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 fair because you know you're doing enough work to kind yeah. of burn it out also. So you Hopefully, can Hopefully, uh, but you as you grow older, yourself. you understand that oh, oh, you know there are certain things you have to be. <laughs> I'm burning, but it's not going <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so then so it's the same thing. So morning, I usually have my oats or uh, like egg whites and idlis and all of that, and then sometime around eleven-ish, I have to have my fruits with nuts. Then I have my lunch, which is again a good balance of um, just salad. Then there's a protein and a carb. So she's basically told me to balance out these things, protein, carb and a salad. And then by around 3.34 and then in, right after lunch, I crave sweet. But I'm told to stay away at least for two hours. So I try to stay away for two hours and I have my sweet. Then I have some around four-ish, I have a sandwich or some kind of a fruit again or something. I really have to have something. I indulge sometimes in samosas and... Rasmalai and things like that. I think after this conversation, I realized we have to have a separate episode about food with Navya <laughs> because <laughs> I'm going to find it so difficult to edit this because she's spoken about food so much. So yes, we do need to eat food and uh, that to the right kind of food. Yeah. So basically, I, I guess it's come out public that you know, I eat a lot of food and I love food. We but are yes. very happy to hear <laughs> this and get to know this about you. Oh yes. So. Yeah, I've had people make fun of it. They're like, every two hours, <laughs> if you have Navya around, you need to keep something <laughs> ready for her. But I guess that's my system. Not for all. It may not it, be. It, it may not, may not work, work for all. True. For me, this works. And uh, my exercise, I just believe that basically my funda is exercise, eat well, sleep well, yeah. try and relax and meditate as much as possible. And that's... So now let's come to your choreographic work. Hmm. So I've seen uh, snippets of your uh, some of your productions. I think Earthen Pot, Namayachi Zani, hmm. which is the most recent yeah. one, which is with Drupad and Bharatanatyam coming together. Yes. Then there was Virodha. Virodha Bas. Yes, that's the one. And all of these works, I find them uh, in in terms of the ideas. There is a contemporary thought in it. And mm. then you mentioned somewhere that there is so much more to explore within tradition. Mm. So how do you bring these two ideas together? This is the first part of the question. And the second part is when you begin with the seed of an idea for a production, mm. how do you build it further? Hmm. So, see, that's something that you said about tradition and the contemporary, right? I believe... See, I, I really don't distinguish as much mm. between tradition and contemporary because I like believe... Like they say, the contemporary today is, is what is going, going to become tradition, tradition tomorrow. And then even the thought process, mm. something that we experience now, perhaps was experienced then as Absolutely. well. It's only that we are bringing it, we're trying to explore it or perhaps stage it in a different way. So, best is to treat it like this flowing river. That's the that's best the thing. Best, yeah. That's, yeah. That's the, I think that you're right. That's the only way of looking at it because tradition flows. Today's contemporary becomes tomorrow's tradition. And it just continuously goes. So I don't uh, like break my head around mm. that. I know mm. I have my art form, which is so beautiful. It's so structured and codified. And it gives you the liberty and the license to stretch and explore. Absolutely. So I feel I've been blessed to have a vocabulary like this. And then for me, it is about... Okay, what at this point in my life is uh, is something that I want to explore? Mm. It's not about creating something new for the audience. It's always about what is it that I want to explore? Because unless it comes from that space, I believe you will not do justice to it.
So that's how I've come up with maybe you spoke about the earthen pot. It was that was the time when I lost my grandmother. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, there's something that's happening in me. Can I explore it? Hmm. Or Namya Chijeni actually wasn't my, uh, ent- I mean, it was on my seed of uh, thing. It was more of my friend Janvi Falsarkar. Hmm. We got to know through a common friend, and she said, this is something that's brewing in her head for the longest time. And she said, I want to explore uh, Janni. And she said, could we try and bring in Bharatanatyam? And at that point, it was quite a daunting thing because. I can understand doing one piece in Hindustani, but mm-hmm. the entire one hour, one and a half hour production in Hindustani music and Marathi, a language that I have no understanding of. Mm. And I, if I have to do justice to that, I have to understand the word to word meaning Absolutely. and the overall meaning. But she helped me through that. And that was, I must tell you that that experience taught me a lot. E- again, I've learned life lessons through that experience, through Janni and how the way she, she uh, I mean, now, uh, this particular character imbued that thing of faith and mm. surrender. So you learn from that. And at that point, I needed to learn that, I guess. And then Paradox, Virodha Bas, again, it was a commission project. Uh, mm. project. So, so somebody, from, I mean, Mandala Arts from Canada, Mr. Jay Govind, had asked me, could you think, uh, when you're doing, sometimes when I see you doing Margam, I see there's something else happening there. So could you explore that, that is happening inside? Oh. So I was having a random talk with my aunt and then with my mother. And uh, my aunt said that, uh, you realize, Navya, you are leading, your, for you, life is a paradox. Hmm. And that's where that journey started. So everything has, it's come from something that has, that has been brewing inside. Hmm. So then I wanted to explore that because I feel when you explore these things, it's also cathartic. Absolutely. It's cathartic Absolutely. and you are in it. It's, a, it's an experience. So that's how I've gone about. This. And, and you see the lines blurring because that's another aspect of being an artist where you don't know when the personal comes into mm. the art and when the art goes into the personal. And that's a shift that we are constantly yeah, going through. All of us through. are going through. I think at every point, you know, your personal gets braided with your... Mm. But that's the honest space that you're talking about. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise it's just going to be, oh, this is for yeah. showing and this is for living. Living, yeah. So I think the honesty of an artist mm. comes through when you have this kind of a liaisoning. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about... See, the thing is, I don't know about the other aspect. Mm. I only know, okay, this is how, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I want to explore. Mm. So I just keep it at that. and Just say... Stay true to what I feel about it. So you wouldn't elaborate about your, like, how do you flesh it out? Like, uh, Yeah, so let's say even for the latest was paradox. So again, so, so with having these conversations, you know, that's the seed of mm-hmm. thought that's planted in you. There are so many things that happen at that point. You just can't take random episodes or stories and then say, oh, this fits in here. So let me put this here. That, at least in my personal opinion, that doesn't work. Has there to has be to be a thread. There has to be a flow. And why am I doing The intent is intent. very important, right? Okay. The intent and then from there, the articulation. Mm. So I spend a lot of time in the intent. I It's a lot about writing. And I keep writing. I keep jotting down points. Because again, it's interesting you talk about Riyas. Because I could just be randomly walking and suddenly this thought will come. Oh, maybe this. Mm. This process will fit in here. Fit in as in there will be it, it there will be an understanding between these two it segments. It'll inform it will inform the other. Okay. And maybe if I have a conversation with somebody and they would say, Navya, this is what I feel. And I'm like, wow, let me look at from their angle. Because many a times, see that's what art teaches us, right? You can't look at one thing only from your angle. Mm. You have to look at from multiple angles and see which one fits your uh, what do you say sentiment which one sits your understanding and then you take that out you distill that out so that process is tedious 
um, it can be heartbreaking mm. but it is extremely exhilarating so it's about writing reading interacting with people i talk to a lot of scholars and and kind of bounce off my ideas with them and then they'll have a different perspective so you should be ready to take that perspective again sit with it there are no miracles here there are no overnight formulas that will help you get this at least for me it's been solid work and then sitting with your musicians interacting with them taking time and being extremely patient hmm. because this is almost like giving birth to a child i suppose so, so you true. have to be patient and be ready for the breakdowns hmm. be ready for the breakdowns but there will be some breakthroughs through it so interacting with the musicians and then choreographing it to see is this being articulated and then sometimes having a like a third eye you know like somebody mm. from your either your mentors or your gurus or even in fact i've had i have friends who are not in the fraternity even better even, even better because totally they'll just blank this is on your face just tell you sorry it made no sense to me Correct. and here you're thinking oh my god this is so beautiful and <laughs> can can you receive it and they're like it's not sorry working. it's not working <laughs> and then i'm like god it hits you hmm. then you realize okay perhaps i have to change certain ways of doing it so that it's more accessible so then you change so all it's a process right yeah but what you've shared is of such great value because it throws light on the entire process of what you know people just see a production mm. on stage but there is so much that has gone till yeah, you birth that that baby on that stage that day yeah so there is a lot of work yes. and it beautifully and nicely you've put it together in a short so if anyone is attempting any new work be ready for a lot of rigor and patience like she said yeah because they say right blood sweat and tears though it sounds very cliche it is the it truth it is the truth <laughs> Okay, so now coming to another aspect of your riyas, and because you also teach, mm. and I know that you were based in US, and you juggle between US and uh, India. Yeah. So how does that change for you? Does your practice there change? Does the weather there, <laughs> <laughs> because of that, if it's too cold, like how is that management? That I mean, that again teaches you something because see, when I was in India, you take it for granted. Mm. Like this is how things are. or beat your audience also you're like okay this is how they understand mm. our language or beat the weather you're like this is how it is but when you go to a different country you're introducing a new art form there though they have been a lot of pioneers who've already done the they've actually done the hard work mm. it was easier yeah. for people of my generation to go there because Correct. people have already done the hard work yet it was again a learning for me because something that i do here has to be accessible to those do, uh, who are seeing it there mm. so you could have indians you could have americans it's a it's a diaspora there and it's people across the world you find in the us so i had to re i had to sit with myself with a particular piece and look at it from a very different angle mm. like how i said my friends who don't know anything about the arts is the same thing there so it's about that's when i realized that i can look into characters from the epic Hmm. and see how relevant they are in today's times because you have taught me that how do you make it accessible to us hmm. and then when it comes to teaching uh again the kids who are growing up there don't go grow up with this understanding of the art form hmm. or they don't take or the it culture the culture is i mean of course the parents they invest a lot of time and energy maybe in, not just the indian ones maybe indian not ones, the, but not the american. americans they don't Correct. know right so how do you make it accessible so for them i understood that i have to break it down hmm. simplify it and make it like a language like you say like right, you say it's english language this hmm. is the grammar these are the words the like like alphabets make a word and the words make a sentence sentences make a phrase then you move on to a para so i had to tell them that this is you would have to use this as a word hmm. and then i realized that that logical way of thinking helps them understand what are we trying to figure out in this vocabulary so you're navigating your teaching also to kind of 
suit the new generation, the new Yeah, country. and and I'm sure even the ones here or even the ones there have asked me, even the Indians there have asked me, I don't relate to this particular emotion. Hmm. So how do I put this across? For me at the age of 12, I learned uh, Javali or you know, <laughs> things which was just like, oh, my teacher would say, no, you have to do this, this is the emotion you do. I can't do that there. Correct. So then I've had moments, I was teaching one of the girls, uh, Terivil Varano, and she said, uh, sorry, this, this doesn't feel great. Why is why is this conversation happening in the first mm. place? Why is she waiting? Why is she waiting? <laughs> why does she want him to look exactly? <laughs> and I'm like, and then I have to sit down. I'm like, oh God, how do I now translate this? Yeah. So then I had to sit down, tell her what it meant. How was it relevant now? I asked mm. her, don't you experience these emotions now? Don't tell me when you, you have a crush on a guy or you had infatuation. The mm. guy just goes by, you're just going to just, oh, great. You are human. You will have an emotion there. I said, True. explore that. So then you realize that you are also doing teaching yourself. You are evolving the pedagogy in a certain way, you know, catering because ultimately the art has to be transferred. Yeah. You have to find ways to, to explore, to experiment. And I think teaching has helped me also learn hmm. quite a bit about my own art form, my potential. They t those students teach you quite a bit, you know. So you mentioned about Adavus and teaching mm. as an alphabet mm. of a language. Mm. How how much do you bring Adavus into your daily practice? Do you mm. practice Adavus? Good question. <laughs> well, I try to do at least the Tattadavu even now. Mm. You know, it gives me a sense of shiver down my spine. Right, yeah, that is <laughs> because I'm like, okay, you need to emotionally be strong <laughs> and you can do it and all that. After the second or third speed, I'm like, okay, this is. Then I tell myself, okay, don't do it, overdo it. But I try my best to do Tattadavu, Nattadavu and my Thirman Adavus because mm. I get a, there's some kind of a kick you get out of True. it. So there are days when I do Adavus, but I try my best to do Alaripu and Jatiswara mm. because mm. I feel I do that back to back. That's that when the energy flow is there. So I try my best to incorporate Adavus, but I have failed many a times and sometimes I wondered, how do my students do it? Hmm. You know, because you're <laughs> teaching them, you expect them to do the first, second, third, go back to the second and then come back to the first. First, I know. And sometimes when I'm teaching them, tell myself, well, you taught them that, why don't you sit and do it? But also remind yourself you did it when you, yeah, <laughs> you I did it. it. <laughs> but I told you, right, sometimes I challenge myself with such things and then I tell myself, don't feel disappointed. It's okay. You did this much. <laughs> okay, so this season in Raz Riyaska, which is our third season we have an interesting addition and what we did was we reached out to all the viewers mm. and we asked them to send in some questions because we wanted you to also be involved and it's not just one-sided like only one person is asking what she wants to know of course it's for the larger benefit but yet we have this one question from one of the viewers so this is a question which has been asked by Rohini Dhananjaya mm. and her question for you is how has your training in Bharatanatyam influenced your artistic expression and in turn your personal growth? And uh, an extension to that question was how does the personal trickle into the art which I think you already hmm. answered. Hmm. But the first part if you want to respond to. It's very profound just to repeat <laughs> it. Rohini your question is very profound so I have to repeat it. <laughs> the question is how has your training in Bharatanatyam influenced your artistic expression hmm. and in turn your personal growth? Just mm. to ease you mm, off, mm, mm, I mm. think the whole of the interview actually answers this question. But if you want to just put a signature on it, what would it yeah. be? Yeah, how would I say it? It's such a. That's why I say it, right? I can keep all, go on and on with these things. Which is why I ease you off. Saying that <laughs> watch the entire interview. That is the answer to this question. I think basically, like how I said that the 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 practice, the the qualities that it instills in you, mm. discipline, practice. Uh, uh, dedication and all of that devotion, e passion, all of these are so heavy words. Mm. But I think that's what has informed my way of living, my personal way of living. Mm. I think that is what has helped me. And if it is my artistic expression, it is about how well can I, how much of, how much can I invest in that? Mm. It's taught me so much. I am not. There's nothing that I need to contribute. It's it's full by itself, and it's so it's it's already an enriched art form. I don't have to do much. It's enriching my life. Wow. So how do I use it to enrich my life, and how do I articulate that to the audience? That's uh, hopefully the line that will answer the question. <laughs> no, I think she's put it beautifully, and I think we all agree with that. 
and now we come to the fun part of our Raj Riyaz ka, which is which is the rapid fire. Oh, you have a rapid <laughs> fire to know. That. Yes, I'm going to rapidly fire some questions at you. <laughs> okay. But well, what is interesting is the mm. questions are really fun and okay. just it's just to kind of have fun to okay, the tail sure, end of it. Sure, sure. Your most favorite jati or tirmanam that you could recite even in your sleep. Most favorite jati or tirmanam. ियन सो what my go to food after a performance of course it takes me time to reach there because yeah, obviously yeah. you're you know going through the ritual of cooling down and all of it but i run to uh, biryani lovely and a bowl of ice cream if i can <laughs> help it super we just wanted to hear that <laughs> favorite seating in an auditorium to watch a performance front middle back middle okay are there days when you don't feel like practicing I you answered already answered that, that. Yes. your favorite go to book that you've reread um that is uh, one is many lives many masters did i get it yeah by brian wiss most favorite ragam shri ragam practice in the morning or evening i prefer practice in the morning but if a uh, situation doesn't give me that uh, liberty then i would do it in the evening but i prefer my morning riyas coffee or tea you already answered coffee coffee <laughs> We know you also paint so which is your most favorite subject and medium Oh god so I used to paint I don't paint <laughs> anymore uh, I was a kid when I started painting but what I love to paint and also photograph is nature Okay A uh, varnam you've performed maximum number of times Swami Nanandana di mai Oh my god that's the <laughs> one yes <laughs> Oh there's a reason why I chanced upon <laughs> that one Your comfort food is um biryani biryani <laughs> Riyaz with a mirror without a mirror both on a rest day sit and watch a movie or go on a trek i know you love trekking i love trekking so trekking is my go to and of course sit and watch a movie and sleep and sleep really wow yeah. one memorable or funny incident with padmini miss okay <laughs> there's one which everybody most of the students of uh, ma'am know mm -hmm. and that is uh, so she had choreographed this she was very good at uh, choreographing these uh, what is a theme based productions mm -hmm. like so we had something called the tri shakti mm -hmm. it's all about the empowerment of women then imagine so i was kittu rani chennamma wow yeah so i had the the kiridam mm -hmm. and i had that uh, the armor mm -hmm. and i had the sword and the shield actual ones wow. and we really had to fight it out really yeah we had to fight out we had to jump and the other person had to you know squat with and all, all of that of yeah that. all of this and it was heavy especially this thing you know how first of all with headset i'm not the best mm. on top of it i have this kiridam and that was also moving around so all that was happening and the makeup of course mm. so after we did all of that we had a train to catch so mm. i think we were coming from coimbatore or pollachi i'm not sure mm. back to bangalore mm. we were running late so my ma padmini ma'am was very straight she's like just get ready just remove whatever you can we have to catch the train <laughs> <laughs> so we all are in the tempo huh. the tempo truck huh. e each of us are trying to remove our thing so performance is over performance is over we just packed our stuff we some of us are still in our costume at least i know i'm still in my outfit <laughs> so i tried to remove all of that i put in something else but i still had my kiri oh no on. okay the one that should have gone off the first time <laughs> and i remember this she's actually sent out somebody to say tell the man to stop the train because no. we are coming she no <laughs> she's capable of doing it and she managed to do it But here I am. I didn't realize I've taken the kiridam and I have sword on one end, and I'm running for the train. <laughs> oh my God, that's a hilarious visual. <laughs> All of us. I remember I'm running. Somebody else is running with a shield. Somebody's running with something else, and I remember I'm running with the kiridam. I'm looking around, and everybody's like, they're just looking at us like this. Like who are they? And I'm like, I don't know what this is. And then I jump onto the train, and I'm like, shoot! Oh this is how God. I looked. Had a ball. Laughed. We laughed our way out. But that teaches you something, you know. <laughs> and also those days, because no mobile phones, there's yeah. nobody wasting time. Oh my God! These me. are just memories and visuals yeah. that you are recreating in your mind. You and know? it's still fresh. Uh, imagine <laughs> if we had those phones now; mm. it would have been a 
like a reel which got like millions millions of, of views by now <laughs> it was it but then it, it, i was like wow it's it's fun at the but end but imagine day. like at a drop of a hat the first thing that came to your mind was this yeah. and which means it's left like a mark in your totally. oh, we've had many <laughs> such episodes so wow. this was but this is one that comes to me because i remember i'm running and i'm thinking why are people looking at me and what's wrong I still have my makeup yeah, on no. i still have the kirida in my hand that so was it was funny. hilarious but yeah that's one thing i remember <laughs> so i at this point want to thank you for all your time and for openly sharing everything if there's a last thought you want to leave us with and mm. we can just be done with I think the only I mean I don't know what's going through me at this point but when I said at this point I feel the best is in life in general and in dance the best is to just live in the moment as much as possible and dance just dance your way out there are days when things may not happen but it's okay life will still go on and you can still dance <laughs> thank you so much navia for your time and all the beautiful words that you spoke my pleasure my thank pleasure you. thank you so much thank you so much for watching us When one uses the word secret one feels it's something that should not be shared it should be guarded but why should knowledge such as this be guarded and not shared if shared it will only result in making better and more dedicated artists and that in turn will only benefit the art we are fortunate to have such artists in the series raz riyaz ka who are breaking the notion of their riyaz being a raz raz riyaz ka